All right, here we go on lesson 10.4. All right, today we're gonna to be talking about inscribed angles and inscribed polygons, specifically triangles and quadrilaterals, but we can talk about any kind of inscribed polygon. Those are the ones we're gonna be focusing on. So we need to define inscribed angle for you. So what in the world is an inscribed angle? So let's come over here. We've got a couple other things we're gonna define as well. Okay, but let's start with inscribed angle. An inscribed angle, different than a central angle. Remember, central angle was an angle whose vertex was right here at the center of the circle. An inscribed angle is going to look different. It's going to look like this. Okay. And once again, we usually don't draw the rest of the angle with the rays. We kind of stop with segments. So an inscribed angle is an angle whose vertex is on the circle. And then the rays are actually just chords. Uh, I shouldn't say rays or chords, but the, the kind of chopped off ray, whatever you want to call that. But what would have been a ray, except that we ended it, all right, these are chords. So this is not considered an inscribed angle. Okay, its vertex is on the circle, yes, but these are not inside as chords, all right? This is not an inscribed angle, okay? Yes, its vertex is on the circle, but this is not inside the circle, okay? We will actually deal with this in another lesson. This we're not really going to talk about much at all, okay? We'll deal with this later on. So this is an inscribed angle. Vertex is on the circle, okay? The sides of the angle are chords. Okay, an intercepted arc is actually going to go right back to this picture. If you notice, we have three arcs going on in this picture. The intercepted arc is the one that, if I actually extended this out with a rays, it's the one that's inside the angle. Okay, so that's this arc right here. Okay, this arc right here. Okay, let's see if I can darken that up enough to see the difference. Okay, that arc right there is the intercepted arc. We're going to refer to that later on. Okay, so this is the intercepted arc. Okay, so maybe if I had something like this, inscribed angle. Right, I've got a, kind of a top left arc, a top right, and a bottom. Which one is the intercepted arc? Well, in this case, it would be the bottom one. This one looks like it might be almost a semicircle. They can actually be major arcs. Let's say we got something like this, kind of a more obtuse angle. That is a major arc. This one's probably a minor arc and so on. So we can have all different size arcs for intercepted arcs. Okay, we're going to talk about how we find their measurements here in a little bit. Okay, an inscribed polygon. Inscribed has the idea of drawing inside of something. Remember, scribe has the idea of to write or to draw. In means inside. We talked about this earlier when we talked about uh, an in center. Okay. Um, or we talked about circumcenter, and circum means to go around, like circumnavigate, or circumference means to go around something. Okay, these two terms kind of go together: an inscribed polygon and a circumscribed circle. So that means that the polygon is drawn inside, and the circle is drawn around the outside. Circle remember means to go around the outside. So it would look something like this. Let's say I've got a circle, and I've got this triangle. This is an inscribed triangle with a circumscribed circle. Okay, Or maybe we have a, a circle and I have some kind of quadrilateral. An inscribed quadrilateral and a circumscribed circle. Now technically you could have something like this where you have a inscribed quadrilateral and a circumscribed quadrilateral as well. Okay, where one quadrilateral is inscribed inside the other one, the outside one would be considered to be circumscribed. All right, this is what you don't want. Okay, this is not inscribed because this vertex is not on the circle. These two are, this one is not, okay? So this is not considered an inscribed polygon. All right, here we go, a couple theorems. Theorem 10.7. All right, theorem 10.7 tells us how to find the measure of this angle and this arc, okay, and their relationship to each other. Remember that when we had a central angle, if I went from A to the center and out to C, then that angle equaled the arc. Well, in this case, this angle is going to be half of the arc, right? So um, the measure 
of angle B equals one half times the measure of arc AC. Okay, or we could rewrite it this way. The measure of arc AC is twice as much as the measure of angle B. Okay, those two concepts you need to be able to work either way. So if I tell you that this is 60, you need to be able to tell me this is 120. If I tell you that this out here is 140, then you need to be able to come in here and tell me that this is 70. Okay, you got to be able to work both ways. All right, come here, double it to get out to here. If you're starting out here, cut it in half to get it into here. Okay, that's what theorem 10.7 tells us. All right, theorem 10.8. All right, so this time I've got, uh, kind of got triangles drawn here. Um, it's not really what I'm worried about is the triangles, although that shows up in lesson 10.6, all right? Uh, we're gonna work with these triangles and their segment lengths, okay? But for now, we're gonna focus on the angles. Here's what's going on. I want to figure out angle V, okay? And then I also wanna talk about angle X. I wanna see what's going on with those guys. All right, so look at angle V. Look out here at the intercepted arc. I probably should have referred to that back here. Angle B, an inscribed angle, is half of its intercepted arc. That's why we talked about that term on the first page, okay? All right, coming back down here. So angle V, which arc is the intercepted arc for angle V? Well, we follow the side of the angle out and it hits W, and we follow it out here and it hits Y. So from W, to y. So the measure of angle V is one half of the measure of arc WY. Okay. Now what about X? Well if I follow X out to W and I follow X out to Y, it's the same intercepted arc. So the measure of angle X is one half times the measure of WY. Well arc of WY isn't going to change. It can't be, you know, 150 when we're talking about angle V, and then it can't be 170 when we're talking about angle X. It's got to be the same. So if I take the same number, whatever this measurement is, and I multiply it by one half, I'm going to get the same answer. So that means angle V and angle X are going to equal the same thing. So therefore, they are congruent. The theorem says this, if two inscribed angles intercept the same arc, then these two angles are congruent to each other. Okay, I'll say that again. If two inscribed angles intercept the same arc, then the angles are congruent to each other. All right, well, what about angle W? Which arc does angle W intercept? Follow the sides of the angle out should notice that it comes out to V and it also comes out to X. So angle W intercepts arc VX. What about angle Y? Same idea, follow it out. It intercepts VX as well. So both angle W and angle Y come out and intercept this arc. So therefore, and they're both inscribed angles, they are congruent to each other. What do we know about these triangles now? Two angles, I know nothing about the sides, but two angles are congruent. We could actually get the third angle congruent by vertical angle theorem. So actually all three angles here are congruent to all three angles here, or I could use the third angle theorem, okay? If the angles are congruent, then the triangles are, hopefully you remember in a previous chapter, triangles are similar similar, and if the triangles are similar, the sides are proportional, proportional. This over this equals this over this, which equals this over this. And later on, we're going to do some work with those numbers when we get to, I believe it's lesson six. Okay, so that's theorem 10.8. Theorem 10.9, two different concepts going on here, but they're related to each other. It's really a converse idea. The problem with this is that it doesn't, it doesn't work well to write it as an if and only the if. So we're going to say it two different ways, but it really is a converse idea. So let's focus over here on this triangle. If I have a right triangle and it is inscribed in a circle, okay, so every corner 
vertex of that triangle is on the circle. And I know it's a right triangle, so there's one right angle. Well, let's talk about what we just learned. We learned that this angle is related to this arc. How is it related to that arc? The angle is half of the arc. So what do I do to the 90 to get this? I double it. So this arc out here must be 180 degrees. Now that's important. If an arc is 180 degrees, the proper term for that arc is a what? What kind of arcs equal exactly 180? Okay, remember it's a semicircle. Semicircle is 180. Well, a semicircle is half the circle, so that means that AC must be cutting the circle in half. What kind of thing cuts a circle in half? A diameter. So, here's what the theorem says. If a right triangle is inscribed in a circle, then the hypotenuse is a diameter. If a right triangle is inscribed in a circle, then the hypotenuse is a diameter. Any questions on that? Make sure you ask me in class. Let's come over to this one. So what's different about this one? Well, I don't have any mark here telling you it's a right angle. I have this dot here though. Hopefully you can see that on the video. I'll make it a little bit bigger. If there's a random dot kind of in the center of the circle, it's not random. It is the center of the circle. We're not going to put a dot right about here just to try to fool you. Okay? So this is the center of the circle and segment XZ goes through the center of the circle. So therefore segment XZ is a diameter. And since it is a diameter, this arc out here, which I can't name, all right, because I don't have the correct number of letters or I need three for that, but that would be a semicircle. And a semicircle is always 180 degrees. And then how do I come in and find the inscribed angle? The inscribed angle is how much of the arc? It is half of the arc and half of 180 is 90. So what kind of triangle do I now have? I have a right triangle, 90 degrees. I have a right angle. So over here, if I have a right triangle inscribed in a circle, then the hypotenuse is a diameter. Over here, if a triangle is inscribed in a circle and one side is a diameter, then that triangle must be a right triangle and the diameter is the what? Which side is this? It's called the what? If it's across from the right angle, it's called the weird word, remember, hypotenuse. Okay, remember these two are called the legs. Okay, so let's talk about these two again. If you have a right triangle inscribed in a circle, then the hypotenuse becomes a diameter. If you have a triangle inscribed in a circle, got to have every letter touching the, the circle itself, every vertex, and one side is a diameter, then the triangle is a right triangle and the diameter is the hypotenuse of that right triangle. Last theorem, theorem 10.10. .10. Okay. This time I have an inscribed quadrilateral. An inscribed quadrilateral along with a circumscribed circle, but we're going to focus on the idea of an inscribed quadrilateral. All right, so let's take a look at this right here, this angle. Now we know that this angle comes out here to that and down here to this. So from here all the way around to here, it intercepts that arc. And this angle is related to this arc how? Remember, this has to equal, or it has to be half of it, right? Okay, so I'm going to call this x right here. All right, this angle, I'm going to go opposite angles. Okay, they're not necessarily congruent. I don't know if this is a parallelogram or something like that. It sure doesn't look like one. All right, but this angle, as I go out to its arc, I follow up to that same spot, out to here, same spot. But this time, we're working the other direction. So I'm going to start here, and I'm going to work all the way, all the way. Got to go a long ways to get there. Looks like a major arc. All right, this angle, let's call it Y, is half of this huge arc. And X is half of this minor arc. But this arc and this arc together, you notice, they don't leave any gaps anywhere. They make up the whole circle. So these two together must equal 360. So X plus Y have to equal half of 360 because X is half of that one and Y is half of that one so together they're half of 360 and half of 360 is 180 degrees. Now we could do the same exact thing for this angle and this angle. This angle 
comes out to here, out to here. Okay, so I would start here and work my way around there. Looks like it's, if I draw straight across, it's below that, so it's less than a diameter, so this is less than 180. All right, now if I take this one, I come up to here and up to here, and I go this direction, that's a little bit more than 180, but together those two arcs add to equal 360. So these two angles would have to add to equal half of 360, and half of 360 again is 180. So what in the world is this theorem telling us? This theorem is telling us that if, a quadrilateral is inscribed in a circle, then the opposite angles must add to equal 180 degrees. Both sets of opposite angles must add to equal 180 degrees. Another word for that, remember, is supplementary. This also works backwards. So I think in the book they have it phrased using the if and only if idea. A quadrilateral can be inscribed in a circle if and only if its opposite angles are supplementary. So you might see a question like this. Can a rectangle be inscribed in a circle? Well, really the question is, does a rectangle have opposite angles that are supplementary? And we know a rectangle, all four angles are equal. They all equal 90 degrees. So yes, the opposite angles will add equal 180, no matter which ones you look at. So yes, a rectangle can be inscribed in a circle. And there are other ones that can be inscribed in a circle as well, and I think some of that ends up in your homework. But the question really isn't, can it be inscribed in a circle? It's, can it be inscribed in a circle by knowing whether or not the opposite angles are supplementary? Okay, so that's the, the theorems. I'm going to uh, stop this video. We're going to do another one with some examples, and we'll, and we'll be done with lesson four.